When I started DMing a weekly game of Dungeons & Dragons, I quickly realized I needed help. So I bought a book of monsters, then a book of magical items, and then one of NPCs. Before I knew it, I had over 38,000 files of third-party content filled with good ideas to use in my games. But now I don't need any more good ideas. What I need is a way to organize all of that content so that I don't feel like I spent all of that money just to have a list of titles that I'll never read. Here's how I managed to do that in Obsidian. I used to keep my D&D notes in the same vault that I keep all my other Obsidian notes, but that quickly got out of hand. This is what my D&D vault looks like now. I've got a bunch of folders here, one for each type of content that I might need, and then I have a few pages outside of those folders to help me navigate all those items. In the monsters folder, I have a markdown file for every monster, and these monsters include the ones that are in the SRD, but a lot of them are from third-party books. I'm at the point where I almost exclusively use monsters from third-party books just because I find them more interesting to run and to play against. Here's an example of a monster that was from the monster manual. For every monster, I have some of their traits and actions, and I also have, more importantly, these tags. These are parameters that I can use for data view queries. Data view is an Obsidian plugin that essentially lets you create your own database, queryable database, out of markdown files. So for all of these monsters, I also have a data view queries page where I already have some filled out. This is what a data view query looks like. You can specify what columns show up in the result and some conditions for the results that are returned. In this one, I'm looking for monsters that contain Bullywug in the name. And here are the results for that. But I can really change that query to whatever I'm looking for at the time. For example, in a recent game, I needed to look for shape changers. I didn't really care what environment they were in. So this is the query for that. I was just searching the tags parameter and the type parameter for something that had shape change. The best part about this is that not only do I have the list of all of those shape changers, but I can also see at a glance what the CR is, their type, the environment, and where they came from. As you can see, the results returned from that query are from third-party books, along with a specific page where that monster is mentioned. I can also search for monsters by CR or by environment if I'm looking for something a little bit more specific. And I do the same thing with magical items as well. I have all of my magical items here in the items folder and I have SRD as well as third party ones like Vault of Magic. And here's my page for magic item tables that actually replace the ones in WotC material. I have all the tables here for various CRs, but they're actually tables within tables. So it says roll three times on this one, and then it takes something from one of these 20 something tables. If I just want something random, I look at this roll section here and then go based on CR. And the cool thing is that each of these also has a page, a markdown file, so then I can open it in a new window and see that item in more detail. So this particular item has multiple variations, so I can see the full text there. Now sometimes though, I want to look for a specific item, like maybe one that doesn't require attunement because my player is already full up, or one that requires a certain kind of spellcaster. For those times, I can also use data view queries. If I scroll down here, you'll see that I use the same query system for items. In this query, I'm looking for an item that beefs up a character's constitution because that happens to be a weak spot of one of my players. And it returns all of the items here and I can also click on each one and see whether it's armor or weapon or a wondrous item. Another thing that every DM needs is a list of names. Sometimes you just don't foresee your players wanting to talk to some random person and asking them their name. So rather than plan out every single interaction, it's way better to just have a list of names that you can roll on on the fly. 
So I have my NPCs page here where I'm pulling in some random tables from elsewhere. This works the same way that my monsters and my items do. For each of these, I'm actually using the Obsidian Dice Roller plugin by Jeremy Valentine. And they're referring to tables that I've created elsewhere. So if I go to the NPC creation page, I have a whole list of tables of different names and descriptions and alignments that I can use in my games. So if I'm looking for just a quick NPC that may or may not be a throwaway, I start here with it already has a quick description and their alignment. And if my players are a little bit more interested, then I can roll on these more detailed mannerisms and ideals and such. I've also recently started incorporating NPCs from a book called The Game Master's Book of Random NPCs. And I have them here as full NPCs. I mean, not every NPC needs to be a full one, but I just find these really cool. So if I open up one of them, they not only have the name and gender and the environment, they ha already have the box text, like the description that I can just read out. And they also have things that characters might learn with a perception check, or sometimes this says for the insightful or for the roguish or for spellcasters. In addition to that, they have a little bit of a backstory and what they're carrying. So if my characters ever just randomly and completely unexpectedly kill an NPC again and ask me what's in their pockets like I planned that beforehand, I'll be ready next time. I also have names here by Ancestry for those times where I really want to draw on the culture of being a dwarf or something like that and use a, a clan name as well as the first name. And then at this section, I have art. Now this is just art that I definitely didn't draw myself. I took it from a variety of sources online, but I keep it here in my gallery folder. I don't publish these anywhere. I just show them to my players and they really enjoy having a photo to attach to a name. So I've embedded in this NPC page a gallery view of some of those NPCs in case I just want to grab something on the fly. Now my inspiration folder has a hodgepodge of different things. One of them is the Corrupted Tarot. I recently backed Wormwood Gaming's Corrupted Tarot Kickstarter and I'm using a tarot deck kind of as a writing prompt. I think there are 78 cards in a deck and each card means something, but it's a very abstract meaning. I created a page for every deck of the tarot and then I roll on this table and I put it up here. This is the result. If I don't like that, I can change it. And I can also delve deeper into that card. So this is the Three of Cups, always has awesome artwork that's very evocative and there's a lot that you can take out of it as well, even if you don't look at the meanings. But then they have like the classical tarot reading meaning and then a corrupted meaning. I use these tarot cards as a way to get fresh new ideas for my games. A recent addition to this vault is Sly Flourish's Uncovered Secrets Volume 1. I am a Sly Flourish Patreon and he has this book that's coming out, The Lazy DM's Companion. Now a lot of these are going to be put in that book, but as a Patreon, I've had access to it for, I don't know, I think it must have been a year now. And I really love it because he has not just the standard things like names, but also strong starts and prompts for secrets and clues, which, which I really use a lot. Each one of these has a table. For example, this is a bunch of tables that he has for the specific adventure type of hunting for an artifact. So you can roll on what the artifact is, where it is, the environment that surrounds that artifact and the guardian and so on. I really like these because it reduces the cognitive burden on DMs. Let's say I want my players to steal a sentient shield in a fairy court and their shadows protecting it and their ooze pools that they'll have to get through and a hungry hydra. There are a lot of things here that I would never have thought to put together. Maybe it doesn't make sense within the context of the story, then I can click on any of these and change it. So you may be wondering, isn't this a lot of work? 
Well, yeah, it is. I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. But I was finding that without this, I wasn't using any of my books at all. See, when you have maybe five of them, you can kind of remember, oh, this one's a good one for this particular monster, but not for NPCs or something like that. But when you have as many as I do, as many as a lot of DMs do these days, then I think that it's almost a question of getting value out of your investment. If you've paid for something, but you can't use it, then what was the point? I kind of look at this as a way to limit how much I buy because if I can't work it into a system that will show me appropriate ideas for whatever I'm looking for, then I probably shouldn't have bought it to begin with. Mike Shea from Sly Flourish wrote an awesome article called The DM's Brain Attic, which talks about doing the same thing. The problem is that that was a little bit more abstract. I think the idea is that you're supposed to read a lot of these things and let those ideas influence you. I don't know about you, but those things don't stay in my brain. I have other things that need to be in my brain on a regular basis. So I've offloaded all of that into a systematic way to put those ideas in front of me when I need it the most. If you want to have a look at any of the plugins that I used for this setup, I'm going to link them down below. I didn't create any of them. I just use them. And if you want to have more of a look in detail of how I run D&D games using Obsidian, check out this video. Thanks for watching.